Welcome to Neo-Paganism and New Religious Movements at Cherry Hill Seminary, course C1521. I will be your professor, Michael Stramiska. The readings for the class this week deal with two types of Asia-related New Religious Movements. First, New Religious Movements that represent a continuation and extension of already established Asian religions. First of all, ISKCON, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, and then Diamond Way, also known as Karma Kaju, which are westernized versions of devotional Hinduism and Tibetan Buddhism, respectively. And then a second category involves new religious movements that draw on Asian religious traditions mixed with other elements, old, new, borrowed, or invented. In other words, new religious movements with an Asian basis, but many eclectic elements. And our primary example is Om Shinrikyo, a very strange mixture of Buddhism and Hinduism, Messianism and Apocalypticism, and many other things, including New Age, popular culture, and pseudoscience. Om Shinrikyo also stands out in the NRMs we look at this week because it is the one that can truly be considered a dangerous cult, as you will see. Two other eclectic Asian new religious movements that involve eclectic elements but without any kind of uh, dangerous or pathological dimension are Panawave and Falun Gong. We'll start with Krishna, that is the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, often called the Hare Krishna movement, with reference to the Hare Krishna, Hare Rama chant used in the group. And if you haven't heard it, it goes something like this, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. So it's a catchy little jingle, and devotees will sing and dance to this for hours and often march through the streets chanting this as a way to attract others and communicate the joyful spirit of this movement. ISKCON is a movement in which the leader is not in any doubt. The leader and founder was A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and he lived from 1896 to 1977. That was his religious name. His born name was Abe Karande, and he was born in Calcutta. And this future Swami, this future holy man, started life as a rather average person, a traditional family man, who made his living as a pharmaceutical company employee, but someone who felt a spiritual calling and went on a spiritual path after meeting a guru in his 20s. He joined a Krishna-oriented sect of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, and Vaishnavism refers to worship of Vishnu. And you may not know Hindu mythology, but Krishna is considered a form of Vishnu. And this particular movement, this Gaudiya Vaishnavism, is based on a particular 15th century Hindu saint who preached a method of devotion to the god as a, a means toward spiritual development and salvation. It was in his old age, in the last 20 years or so of his life, that Prabhupada decided to undertake a mission to spread Krishna devotion to the world outside India, particularly to the West. And this started when he came to the USA in 1966 and gradually established ISKCON in New York City. So we might say that Hare Krishna religion starts with a New York state of mind. The Krishna movement got off to a roaring start in the 1960s. 
partially, no doubt, because it coincided with the rise of the counterculture and the non-materialistic, loving atmosphere projected by the Krishna movement, as well as the rising interest in India in the 1960s, no doubt helped its appeal. And by the time Prabhupada died in 1977, his con was a great success, thriving in the USA and many other countries. Its outreach with such elements as music, chanting, and sharing Indian food and culture appealed to spiritually curious hippies and others, including one very important influencer of the time, the Beatle George Harrison, who helped promote ISKCON in various ways, including producing and performing in several songs that became worldwide hits that were version of the Hare Krishna chant. ISKCON, or Krishna Consciousness, the Hare Krishna movement, is centered on joyous devotion to Krishna through chanting, singing, dancing, with its most serious devotees living in ascetical communes. Prabhupada left instructions for ISKCON to continue with collective leadership, which became known as the GBC, the Governing Board Commission. However, in the decade after his death, splits and scandals involving uh, the physical and sexual abuse of children and others in the movement rocked Krishna consciousness. But to the credit of uh, Krishna consciousness, the movement managed to reform, to address some of these problems, and it has survived. And there have been no further such scandals in recent decades. The mythology and iconography of the Krishna movement centers on a sacred couple, Krishna the God and Radha, his partner and lover, who takes on the role in the religion as the symbol and in a sense the role model for all devotees of Krishna. And this involves an interesting gender bending aspect because in relation to Krishna, all of his worshipers, whether male or female, take on an essentially female role as the lover of Krishna. So it's an interesting dimension. The loving relationship between the two also has its darker side because in the mythology and in the stories of Krishna and Radha, Radha often feels abandoned by Krishna, sad and lonely, because she can't always be with Krishna. And this is given a theological explanation in the Krishna religion, that the sadness and loneliness that Radha feels at being deprived of Krishna's companionship has a deeper meaning, a spiritual meaning, that we all at times feel cut off from God or from the greater spiritual reality and wish to be connected to it. But God or the greater spiritual force, whatever you imagine a larger spiritual reality to be, is for everyone. It's not for one person to possess. So in this way, the Krishna religion weaves in this element of a romantic relationship between Krishna and Radha with a larger vision of spiritual reality in which we are all attempting to connect to the divine. Certainly the story and the iconography of the love of Krishna and Radha is a very appealing element of the religion. But it should be noted that in the full mythology of Krishna, this is only one phase of his life. Krishna as a love man, as a young man who loves many women, but has a particular relationship with Radha. The story of Krishna actually starts with him as an infant, born to human parents who do not initially understand that their son is a god. There are many amusing scenes where Krishna suddenly manifests some aspect 
of his divinity and his parents, especially his mother, are amazed or are taken aback. For example, there's a story that at one point Krishna yawns, the baby Krishna yawns. His mother looks into his mouth and can see the entire universe inside of it. A rather unsettling moment, but she takes it in stride and carries on with her devotion to her child. There's another story where Krishna is out playing in a kind of sandbox area. Mother looks away, looks back, and a little pile of mud or sand that Krishna is playing with, and that he's holding up with his hand, actually becomes a massive mountain, and little baby Krishna is holding up a mountain. So there are many moments like this. And Krishna as the baby is another attractive factor for the Krishna religion. Now the Krishna and Radha story comes a bit later in his mythological career when he's become a young man and he's employed as a cowherd out wandering around the hillsides with the cows. And he has a flute that he plays and when he plays the flute it attracts women to him who want to be his lover. And one of these is Radha, who he develops this particularly close relationship with, but it's known that he has other lovers as well. And as I mentioned earlier, this is given this theological explanation that God, or Krishna, the higher divine principle, is something for everyone, not for any one person to possess exclusively. There's a third phase of Krishna's career, where he, he is the advisor to a warrior prince on the edge of a great and terrible war. In this story, Krishna is in disguise as the chariot driver of the prince Arjuna, who's about to undertake this horrible war that forms the heart of the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. On the battlefield, Arjuna is seized with doubt as to whether it's worthwhile to conduct this war and whether he wants to be involved in this awful violence and killing. Krishna advises him that according to the teachings of Hinduism, each person has their duty related to their caste identity. And since Arjuna is a Kshatriya, the caste of warriors, it is his duty to perform war and that he should feel no guilt about it. Arjuna has many doubts, and the discussion between Krishna and Arjuna forms the text known as the Bhagavad Gita. Gita means song, Bhagavan is God, Bhagavad Gita is the song of God or the song of the Lord. And Krishna goes through a number of different arguments to convince Arjuna to execute the war. And I won't go through all of that, but I'll mention one other, which is that he says to Arjuna, all mortal beings die and are reborn hundreds, thousands of times. The people you kill today will not really die because they will be born again. And then another argument, Krishna says to Arjuna, you can, can consider all of this a sacrifice you are performing to me. And whatever you dedicate to me is not sinful. It is sacred. So Bhagavad Gita is a quite interesting text. It goes through a number of different arguments. And since in my graduate student days, I was engaged in a deep study of Hinduism, I remember a professor of mine, Professor Narayan Rao at University of Wisconsin, saying in the impish way that he had about him, he said, the Bhagavad Gita is a text with many different points of view. You could pretty much use it to justify anything. You could use it to justify nonviolence. You could use it to justify violence. He said even the killer of Gandhi could use it to justify his assassination of Gandhi. So an interesting element here. But as the, far as the Krishna movement is concerned, 
the real focus is on Krishna as a loving God who human beings are called upon to offer their devotion to in the hopes of his protection and assistance in liberation or salvation. And here you have further images of Krishna and Radha. And it's interesting that Krishna is often pictured as black. He's called the black one. But in more modern depictions, he's often, like other Hindu gods, portrayed as having light blue skin. And that is something that's developed over time. It's just a typical way of representing divinity to give them this blue color. As I mentioned earlier, Prabhupada was initially a member of an Indian religious movement dedicated to the god Vishnu and worshipping Krishna within the context of uh, Vishnu devotion. And then he went to America, to New York City, and formed Krishna Consciousness as a movement. Now, this Krishna Consciousness could therefore be seen as an American religion based on Indian traditions. But the whole thing came full circle because eventually Prabhupada and his followers went back to India and established Krishna Consciousness as a major movement within in India also. And the center of Krishna devotion and the Krishna movement in India is the city of Vrindavan. And this is sacred to Krishna followers because according to the mythology of Krishna, this was his birthplace when he had his human incarnation. So Vrindavan is quite holy to the Krishna movement and there is a vast and beautiful Krishna temple there from which you see a picture here. One of the ways in which the Krishna movement promoted itself was by distributing a vast amount of literature in many different languages. I did research on the Krishna movement and also the Tibetan Buddhist movement that will investigate briefly the uh, Diamond Way or Karmakaju movement in Lithuania when I was living there in 2005 and when I returned in 2009. And when I interviewed Krishna movement members in Lithuania, many told me that for them, the first step into the movement was encountering this Krishna literature. So the Krishna movement would raise money by selling books, selling flowers, selling other items in public places. And for a long time, they were associated with airports. They were kind of synonymous with airports in the 70s and 80s, although that's died away now. But one of the things they would do is either sell or just offer for free these books about Krishna, including the Bhagavad Gita, as well as other texts. And so this is actually a religion with a strong textual basis. And this worked very well for the Krishna movement. As mentioned before, the Beatle George Harrison was a major booster of the Krishna movement. And here you have clips of a couple videos of uh, songs that he helped to produce for the Krishna movement that actually became international hits. So it was not at all a bad thing for the movement to basically have the Beatles working for them, or at least one Beatle, George Harrison. It should also be pointed out that in 1968, at Harrison's instigation, all of the Beatles went to India to spend time studying under a guru, uh, Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, who was the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Movement. Different from the Krishna Movement, but nonetheless an Indian movement based on Indian traditions. And so the, Indian, the uh, Beatles travel to India was a major boost, not just for Krishna Movement, but for Indian religion and spirituality in general in the United States, in England, and indeed around the world. And in fact, when I researched Krishna movement in Lithuania, there were some older Krishna members who told me that in fact, George Harrison's involvement with India and Krishna 
was one of the factors that caused them to become interested. Something else that developed within the Krishna movement that's of great interest is their Food for Life program. This started with Prabhupada living in the East Village in New York City and having the inspiration that both people needed food. There were hungry people on the streets who could benefit from food. But secondly, that providing Indian food, which was something of popular interest at the time, could be a very good way to promote the religion. In other words, come for the meal, stay for the religion. And this became a worldwide strategy of the Krishna movement, which I also heard about when I did my research in Lithuania. And a famous quotation of Prabhupada was that no one within 10 miles of a Krishna temple should go hungry. So they made a major focus, and this continues today, that the temples provide meals that people can come and have free of charge. And of course, when they're having the meal, they're exposed to the whole ambiance of the Krishna movement, and then some may decide to join. But it's an example of a really quite wonderful philanthropic effort by a religion that has indeed a, a missionary element. It is, of course, hoping to convert people to the religion or interest them in the religion. But at the same time, it's simply an excellent philanthropic effort at feeding those who need food. Vegetarianism is also important in Krishna consciousness, both as a general Hindu value and also out of a particular respect for cows as a sacred animal to Krishna, who was a cowherd tending cattle in his boyhood. And I think it's probably fair to say that the Hare Krishna promotion of vegetarianism starting in the 1960s is one of the factors in making the vegetarian and now vegan lifestyle something widespread in Western societies today. As mentioned, I did research on the Krishna consciousness movement in Lithuania in 2004 and 5 and 2009. And here's an image of the Lithuanian leader of the Kaunas Krishna temple, Sankarshan Das Adhikari. And here you see a religious ceremony with joyous feasting in the Kaunas Krishna temple in Lithuania. And this is typical of what you'd find in Krishna temples anywhere. Here are Hare Krishnas, or more specifically, members of the Hare Krishna movement, performing kirtan, the practice of chanting in publicly in order to attract new followers, on the street in Kaunas. And here are more of the same, Krishnas on the move on the street in Kaunas. And you'll notice that only a couple of them are wearing specifically Indian Hindu Krishna garb. Most of them are just wearing ordinary clothes. And this connects to an important trend in the Krishna movement over the last 20 to 30 years. Originally, the movement centered on hardcore devotees who would live in temples and were expected to live a more or less ascetic life although accommodation was made for families with particular rules about sexuality that couples were only supposed to engage in intercourse once a month. Over time, however, the Krishna movement in many countries has seen that most people who are interested in the Krishna religion do not actually want to renounce ordinary life and live in a temple. Rather, they prefer to live their ordinary lives, their jobs, with their jobs, their families, etc., but then come to the Krishna temple to worship and for special events. And this has been the trend. So now, nowadays, there are not so many people 
living in Krishna temples anymore. Most people live their ordinary lives and then come to the Krishna temple for religious purposes. So in this way, the Krishna movement has become much more like other religions, such as Christian denominations in Western countries. In Lithuania, there's a traditional holiday in February known as Kazuoko Muge. And this is very much like Mardi Gras in America. It's a joyful celebration right before Lent kicks in for Christians. And in Lithuania, this has morphed into a general celebration of Lithuanian traditional culture with people singing, playing traditional instruments, um, having food and other items sold by vendors in the streets. So it's very much a festival atmosphere. And when I was researching these Eastern religions in Lithuania, one of my Buddhist um, informants, a member of the Karmakashu Tibetan Buddhist movement, told me that he found it really annoying that when he went with his kids to experience this very Lithuanian atmosphere, that the Krishnas might suddenly burst forth chanting Hare Krishna. And he said he had no problem with the Krishnas doing their religion, but he didn't like them interrupting this very Lithuanian holiday. And here, let me share something from my personal experience of the Krishna movement. As a teenager growing up in America in the 1970s, I had the common understanding of the Hare Krishnas, as we would call members of the movement, as odd people with shaved heads, orange robes, chanting weird stuff, and selling books and incense in airports. So to me at that time, they were just one more weird cult among others. And then when I was in graduate school in Wisconsin in the 1980s, I had a different experience because one of my fellow graduate students was a former Krishna member. And she gave me insight into how meaningful this religion could be for someone. And also in that period, a female Indian student that I knew disappeared and was rumored to have joined the movement. But it was really not until I encountered the Krishnas in Lithuania in 2004 when I decided I would undertake research about the movement and its position in Lithuanian society that I began to see this movement in a kinder, more positive light, finding that the members I got to know were intelligent, sincere, dedicated people, not strange or damaged fanatics. I was especially impressed by the Food for Life program which showed a social consciousness beyond the often self-centered spirituality common in many New Age movements and also new religious movements. So overall, I ended up with a much more positive view of the Krishna movement. And now let's move on to another Asian-derived religious movement known as Diamond Way, which is a westernized version of the Tibetan Karmakaju Buddha school. And this is a form of Buddhism in which there is a lineage of leaders, a descent of leaders who are understood to reincarnate uh, in successive generations. And so it's not simply that a, a father gives birth to a son or, a, or <laughs> that I should say that in a family, a new son becomes a new Lama. It's not that simple. It's that a reincarnation occurs, and then a search is undertaken to find where the child has been reincarnated. And you'll see this, this has had certain complications for the Karmakaju movement. This is a westernized movement which has been led by Ole Nidal, a Danish man who was traveling in India and surrounding countries in the late 60s, early 70s, and came to know members of the Karmakasha movement and then came to be initiated into it as a, a lower level Lama himself. So a, a certified um, priestly figure. 
and he was given the mission to bring Diamond Way or Karmakashu to the West, which he then did with great success, accompanied by his wife, Hana. So Ole Nidal's story is quite interesting, and it really helps connect this new religious movement to, to the time and place of the 60s and 70s. He began as a hippie interested in acquiring drugs, in uh, hashish and other substances, in India, Tibet, Nepal, and that region. But he would go on to become an ambassador of Tibetan Buddhism. So he was born in Denmark, came across Karmakaju while he was traveling in Nepal with his late wife, Hana, in the late 1960s. And they were involved in the hashish trade. However, <clears throat> when he came to know people in Karmakashu and underwent training in their techniques, he discovered that Buddhist meditation gave superior experiences than did drugs like hashish. And eventually, he was taken into the movement and trained in very esoteric high-level practices by the 16th Karmapa, and Karmapa is the name for their leading Lama, uh, Rangzon Rigpe Dorje. Dorje gave Ole and Hani, Hana Nidal the title of Lama in 1973 and gave them the mission to spread Karmakashu in the West. And since that time, Ole and Hana, although she passed away now in 2007, were very successful in establishing Diamond Way centers across Europe, across the USA, into Russia, into Latin America, into many parts of the world. So it has become a truly international movement, but largely because of the work of this Western ambassador, this Dane Ole Nidal, the former hippie drug runner. And he has indeed proven a very effective and charismatic frontman for Diamond Way Buddhism. But also somewhat controversial, because what critics of the movement point out is that he has interpreted Diamond Way to be very suitable for a very hedonistic lifestyle. So he encourages his followers to, to enjoy free love, to not be worried about traditional norms, he himself is a devotee of skydiving. So he's not at all your traditional holy man. He's more of a, a wild man. You can still see some of the hippie in him. So he, he presents a very appealing, fun version of Buddhism. But he is, in fact, quite serious about the value of the teachings and practices. Diamond Way, with its original name being Karmakaju, is Tibetan in origin, with a long history of Tibetan Buddhist masters known as Karmapa going back to the 12th century, and the Karmapa are believed to be reincarnated over and over. Karmakaju is one of the four main Tibetan Buddhist lineages, predating the lineage of the Dalai Lama, the Galupa, by 400 years. It is now based in India, just like the Dalai Lama's form of Tibetan Buddhism, because of the communist takeover, the communist Chinese takeover of Tibet in the 1950s, which caused many Tibetans, including the followers of these forms of Tibetan Buddhism, to relocate to India, where they have now become established. So there are different levels of involvement among members of the movement. The lay devotees practice meditation from chanting to visualization. And those who become more and more involved and dedicated may become monks. Lame Ole, founder of Diamond Way meditation centers across Europe and beyond, 
teaches both traditional Buddhism and his own arguably hedonistic variety. Sex, no problem. Asceticism, not required. However, it is important to note that he was trained by quite ascetic, quite celibate Tibetan monks. So he represents kind of a stretching of the norms of uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks and teachers. But there is, in fact, a strand of the Tibetan tradition that allows for unconventional leaders, so-called crazy monks. On this slide, I have text that comes from the Diamond Way movement itself. This is how Diamond Way presents itself. I have visited Diamond Way meditation centers in several cities in Lithuania and in New York City in the United States. And I can verify that these are very uh, pleasant, friendly places. They have lecture meetings for those curious about the movement. And then people can become more involved as they wish, but there's no heavy pressure on people. Here is a list of Diamond Way centers in the United States. You can see that it really has spread widely across the country. And as I made this list a few years back, there are probably even more of these nowadays. It is indeed a very successful religious movement. There have been some controversies along the way. First of all, Lame Ole. His lifestyle, with frank acceptance of open sexual relationships and enjoyment of pleasures like driving race cars and skydiving, has caused some suspicion, although perhaps also added to his and Diamond Way's appeal. Ole has also joined forces with right-wing nationalistic Islamophobes in denouncing an Islam and seeking to keep it out of Europe. I had direct experience of this when I went to a Lama Ole lecture in New York City and found it quite jarring that he shifted from very pleasant, friendly chat about his early hippie adventures in Asia to suddenly fiercely denouncing Islam as an evil, dangerous religion. It just didn't seem to me in keeping with the overall Buddhist ethos. But the biggest controversy that the movement has faced is a disagreement over the identity of the reincarnation of the 16th Karmapa. And the 16th is the one who initiated Lama Ole. And this has led to a split in the Tibetan Buddhist community with Lama Ole and another high level monk who has the title of the Sharmapa supporting one candidate and the Dalai Lama and also the Chinese government supporting another, both of whom are now functioning as Karmakaju religious leaders and both claiming to be the 17th Karmapa. So this has created a lasting schism in the Diamond Way movement. And probably from this point, there will simply be two different sub lineages one tracing from the candidate supported by Lama Ole and the other sub lineage arising from the candidate supported by the Dalai Lama and Communist China. Lama Ole is an engaging writer. He's written numerous books that you can easily find. And so he's been quite a successful and clever promoter of this form of Buddhism. And here you see photos of the 16th Karmapa, Rangjin Rigpe Dorje, who is the Lama who initiated Ole Nidal and his wife into Diamond Way Karmakaju, 
gave Ole the title of Lama and told him to spread Karmakaju in the West. And he passed away in 1981. And here you see the 17th Karmapa supported by Lama Ole in Diamond Way. This is Trinle Tai Dorja, who was born in 1982. And some of the text here comes directly from the Diamond Way site. So this is the Karmapa supported by Lama Ole. Then there's an alternative person supported by the Dalai Lama and also by the Chinese government. It's not only Lama Ole who recognized Trinley as the 17th. There also was another major figure, uh, Shamar Rinpoche, who's seen as the secondary status figure in the Karmakashi lineage. And here you see Ogyen Trinle Dorja, the other 17th Karmapa, supported by the Dalai Lama and the Chinese Communist government, opposed by Lama Ole and his International Diamond Way organization. Now it should be noted that the Dalai Lama is not a member of this lineage, so to some extent his support could be seen as questionable interference, and obviously the same could be said of the Chinese Communist government. But indeed, many Tibetan Buddhists, not members of Diamond Way, but Tibetan Buddhists in Tibet and India and elsewhere, have seen him as valid and are now following him. And he has performed his role very well, showing dignity, capability, and become very involved in environmental issues and the cause of digitizing Tibetan Buddhist texts to make them widely available and to preserve them from any possible destruction of texts considering the tense situation with China. And here you see other images of him. And here's a photo I took of Diamond Way Karmakaju members in Kaunas, Lithuania. If you look at the um, center of the picture, the young man with a brown hoodie, and there's a, a younger kid in front of him, that fellow uh, is emerging as a real leader of this movement, and he's undertaken very serious uh, Tibetan Buddhist training. So Karmakachu is alive and well in Lithuania. And here you have the entire Karmapa lineage with some explanation to the right. And I think unless you're doing research into the movement or you're becoming a member, this may not be of interest to you, but I just wanted to provide this piece of information about the history of Karmakaju. And here we have the second highest figure in Karmakashu, the Shamar Rinpoche, the 14th Sharmapa, and he passed away in 2014. But he's important for our story because he is one of the Tibetan figures who stood behind the claim of um, Trinle Tai Dorje to be the 17th, the 17th Karmapa that is. And here, a photo of the 17th Karmapa Trinle Tai Dorje giving initiation to Buddhists in Kiev. And right behind him, or to, to the left of him, you can see Lama Ole is also there. But Lama Ole is clearly subordinate to the Karmapa. And here we see Lama Ole receiving a blessing from Trinle Tai Dorje, the 17th Karmapa. And this image makes very clear, Lama Ole accepts the spiritual superiority and leadership of the 17th Karmapa, even though he's much, much younger than Lama Ole. 
And here you see Lama Ole and his wife Hana with the 17th Karmapa, showing their close and friendly, and respectful relationship. Hana Nidal died in April of 2007, and Trinley Tai, the 17th Karmapa, issued a very touching statement to the Sangha, the community of the Karmakaju. It is a sad and tragic moment that Hana Nidal had to go before her time. In her time, she did all that she could. Hana and Ole Nidal were one of the closest disciples of me, my predecessor, and my teacher, H.H. H. Shamar Rinpoche. She has kept her promise to spread the Dharma in the West. For that, we are all deeply appreciative and grateful. When she passed, she passed as a true practitioner of the Dharma, and her husband and Dharma partner, Ole, was a witness to this. We should not grieve over her passing, but rather rejoice in her accomplishments and activities. What she has achieved is beyond measure, and she is simply irreplaceable. Though her physical form is no longer with us, her compassion and loving kindness will be. In these times, we should dedicate our merit so that her wishes will come true. Here, let me share with you one of the conclusions of the article I wrote comparing Diamond Way and Krishna Consciousness as religious movements. And the key point of difference I found is in their relationship to Asian cultural heritage. Diamond Way, Karmakaju, downplays its connection to Tibetan culture. Although it does not reject it, this heritage is seen as secondary to properly following the practices of Karmakaju, regardless of where they originated. Diamond Way centers have some Tibetan decoration, but mainly just some statues and pictures, which are minor aspects of the environment. They're not highly emphasized. So the way some Diamond Way practitioners explained it to me is that, yes, Karmakaju originated in Tibet, but that's no longer important. It's now part of the world. It belongs to all humanity. So the Tibetan origins are not very important anymore. What is important is the teachings, the practices. And one member described it to me as a kind of spiritual technology, a great spiritual technology that originated in Tibet, but is now a worldwide phenomenon. And so I found Karmakaju members not extremely interested in Tibet or Asia. Um, and in fact, when I brought up the issue of Tibet's difficult social and political situation, as it is now under Chinese communist domination, as it has been from the 1950s, they didn't express great interest in this. So I think this is a case where the original cultural background and the cultural heritage has been increasingly de-emphasized over time. It's quite opposite with the Krishna consciousness movement. Krishna consciousness revels in its Indian roots and its temples are filled with reminders of India from traditional Indian music to Indian cooking to Indian clothing and so on, making a, a Krishna temple a kind of mini India. So here, the cultural heritage is seen as extremely important. And in fact, many Krishna de devotees make pilgrimages to India, to Vrindaban, that city that is closely associated with Krishna. So comparing the two, a de-Indianized ISKCON is impossible to imagine, but it is possible to imagine a largely de-Tibetanized Diamond Way. In fact, it seems to be evolving in that direction quite consciously. So to describe this contrast in a short, pithy manner, for one religion, Krishna Consciousness, 
Religion is largely identified with culture. Religion, to some extent, is culture. But for the other religious movement, Diamond Way, the origin, the culture is unimportant. Religion, the Karmakaju religion, is seen as a technology of liberation. The origins and cultural background of which are not seen as so important. So quite a large contrast between the two. Another contrast I found very intriguing is the different ways the two religious movements relate to society overall. Diamond Way, while open to all at first glance, is somewhat elitist, not being very much concerned with helping the poor or suffering, but only in attracting those able to stay the course with its rigorous training program. So we might say this is more of a head religion than a heart religion. It caters very much to those of a serious intellectual bent, perhaps more so than people who are more emotionally oriented in their approach to religion. And Diamond Way, unlike the Krishna temples, does not open the doors or provide food to people in the community who may need help. It doesn't have that kind of compassionate response to society. As one Lithuanian Diamond Way member explained to me, we are not trying to help the sick become healthy, but help the already healthy become super healthy. Krishna consciousness is on the other side of the spectrum being very concerned with providing kindness and support and indeed food to anyone who needs it. And the best example is the Food for Life program, but it's also the case that temples are open for people who need a place to stay. So I would say in, in the structure of this contrast, perhaps Krishna consciousness could be described as more of a heart religion, catering to emotions of vulnerability and the need for help and the need to show compassion and to help others. And this contrast to me was very instructive. It made me consider how one reason people might choose this or that religion to join it's how it relates to a vision of society. Do you want to be in the elite above the ordinary person? Or do you want to be those among those who try to help those in need? Those are very different motivations and we see them clearly mapped out in this contrast. Next, we'll look at a very different Asian new religious movement, Om Shinrikyo a religious movement that's gone down in modern history as a very terrifying, dangerous, anti-social movement. Here on this Time magazine cover, you see the phrase cult of doom. That is very much how this religion was perceived when it broke into worldwide consciousness in the mid-90s after a frightening incident in which members of the movement went onto the Tokyo subway and released a, a lethal nerve gas, sarin. Um, and yet this is a religious movement deeply steeped in um, Buddhist, Hindu, and other esoteric teachings. So it truly is a puzzle as to how this developed into such a, a dangerous and anti-social movement. So Om Shinrikyo means something like Supreme Truth Sect. And it was founded by a man named Chizuo Matsumoto, originally yoga teacher and masseuse, born in 1955. And he started this in about 1987. 
And I should also mention Asahara is close to blind, or he was, I should say, he is no longer among the living, but he had a legal blindness um, and uh, very limited eyesight. He later would take on the name Shoko Asahara, and that is how we'll, we will refer to him. So over time, this developed out of yoga, massage, into a movement which put high value on Asahara having magical abilities like the ability to levitate, which he claimed to be able to teach to his followers. And it also developed a very apocalyptic view of the world, a sense that the world is going to end in the future and that OM members want to be among the survivors. But this led the movement on a very dark path of recruiting members with advanced technological and scientific skills, developing their own chemical and biological weapons, and also purchasing military hardware from other countries. So this movement was actually planning to be an army that could conquer or at least defend itself in Japan in a time when it expected to see catastrophic events cause chaos in the world. And here you see some more images of Shoko Asahara and Om Shinrikyo. And we see that in its early stages, Om was simply a one among many Eastern oriented Buddhist plus esoteric movements developing in Japan, a country that actually has been very fertile ground for new religious movements. And in the beginning, there seemed to be nothing worrisome or strange about the movement. It was one of many such religious movements. And it gained government recognition in 1989, meaning it acquired legal status to function as a religion. And Shoko Asahara was very successful in recruiting followers, and the movement grew rapidly and became rather wealthy. It amassed a lot of resources. It invested in various kinds of businesses that it could run tax-free and with minimal regulation because of Japanese laws that try to prevent government interference with religion. Ohm appealed to highly educated but also rather alienated people, to put it in crude uh, contemporary terms, we might say it appealed to anti-social geeks with high levels of knowledge in technical and scientific fields. So Shoko Asahara also had a message which was very appealing to people in uh, realms of science and technology and obviously valuing their entrance into the religion, which ultimately led, led to these very negative aspects of developing weapons of various sorts. So with his, shall we say, army of techno geeks, Ohm was very successful in developing biological and chemical weapons. And then with the financial resources it had amassed, it could invest in actual military hardware things like attack helicopters and missiles. As to the teachings and practices of this religious movement, Shoko Asahara blended Buddhism, Hinduism, yoga, and pseudoscience to create a modern seeming scientific appearing religion, putting him as the center as the guru identified with the Hindu god Shiva. And incidentally, in Hindu mythology, Shiva is the destroyer who brings about the destruction of the world at the end of very long cycles, with the understanding the world will then be reborn again. But that association is significant because clearly Shoko Asahara did believe that the world was bound for destruction. And it looks like he wanted to be right at the center of that leading the way forward. 
that as time went on, he took on more and more absolute authority, presenting himself as the supreme enlightened being. And this is what we could say is one of the characteristics of a dangerous cult, when the leader has absolute authority and no one is allowed to question him or her anymore. Omu, and that is how the Japanese would pronounce the, the name of the movement, Om Shinrikyo or Omu devotees were encouraged to give up their ordinary lives, cut all their ties, live in simplicity and devotion in Om facilities, preparing for the end of the world and a new world order where Asahara would be the ruler. <clears throat> the movement's practices involved achieving higher levels of consciousness through various disciplines, special diets, practices of yoga and meditation, and then going a bit more into technology, strapping on special headsets that supposedly allowed devotees to tune into Shoko Asahara's brainwaves. Practicing or imagining levitation was another practice using narcotics and hallucinogenic substances that were involved in confessions and initiations expected of members and members were also expected to perform various duties even criminal actions including murder to serve Asahara as the supreme guru. Om Shinrikyo started as a humble yoga school and ended up a massive organization with both religious and military aspects dedicated to mass destruction to usher in an apocalypse. Using funds from various enterprises, some of them illegal, Omu members traveled to Russia and elsewhere to buy high-tech military gear to construct facilities to produce nerve gas and other fearsome weapons. Critics and former members were harassed, some even killed. Politicians were bribed and journalists were manipulated either by flattery and or deception or by threats. And then it all came to a head on March 20th, 1995, when Ohm members released sarin nerve gas on the Tokyo subway, sickening many and killing more than a dozen Japanese. A planned second chemical attack would have killed even more people, possibly thousands, but fortunately it failed. Here you see images from that awful day in 1995 when Ohm members released sarin nerve gas on the Tokyo subway. You see the people fallen down, stricken, covering their mouths, trying to avoid the nerve gas. You see the public officials and medical staff in hazmat suits and people being carted off into ambulances. As modern Japan post-World War II has been an extremely peaceful orderly society, this event was extremely shocking and disturbing. And needless to say, after this day in 1995, there was little love toward Om Shinrikyo across Japanese society. Although, as stated before, Japanese law tends to protect religions from overmuch interference by government authorities. After the Tokyo subway attack, the gloves were off. Police and other authorities came down really hard on Om raiding their facilities, discovering their weapon production equipment, and Asahara and his top lieutenants were all arrested by 1996. When he was finally put on trial, Asahara refused to speak and remained totally silent throughout the proceedings. He was convicted of murder and other crimes in 2004 and sentenced to death. And Japan 
like the United States and few other industrialized countries today, still has a death penalty. Shoko Asahara's execution was long delayed while various investigations of Ohm continued, but it was finally carried out on July 6, 2018. This was not the end of Ohm. Ohm continues in a modified form renamed as Aleph. The government is now keeping this group under surveillance, but its members claim that they were not involved in crimes and have no intention of any such dangerous activities. Because of Om Shinrikyo, new anti-cult laws have been passed in Japan and other countries. One of the most striking aspects of Om Shinrikyo is how it combined ancient Asian spirituality with modern science and technology. So a very curious blend. And clearly, for those who became members, it was an intoxicating, powerful, compelling mixture of ideas that could motivate them to perform extreme actions, including murder. And here, one more image of Shoko Asahara and Om Shinrikyo. And it's worth noting that its members included very high level, highly educated people. And it's a good reminder that in matters of religion, high intelligence, high education do not mean that people will not become in religions that others might find very strange or disturbing. Let me add a personal note about Om Shinrikyo. I was living in Boston in 1995, involved in my graduate studies at Boston University, when the Tokyo subway attack took place. At the time, I had developed a side business of tutoring foreign students, recent immigrants, and others in English, and I'd had a number of Japanese students, including visiting medical researchers. And so we ended up discussing the Ohm situation in detail. What most impressed my Japanese friends is that Ohm had attracted so many highly educated people, the best and brightest of Japan. This was, in a sense, one of the most disturbing parts of the story. Not just that these terrible crimes had been committed, but that this religious movement this dangerous cult had attracted such highly intelligent, highly educated people. It remains puzzling and disturbing. A friend of mine in Japan, a Japanese poet and journalist named Chikako or Ako, who I had met in 1998, had a unique story to tell about the subway attack. She had been working as a journalist in Tokyo in 1995, and she was actually on the subway the morning of the attack. However, Akko was running late for work. And when all this commotion began around her, all she was thinking is, oh no, I'm going to be late for work. And she was so focused on that that she completely missed the importance of what was happening around her she just wanted to get past it and get to work. So she missed the most important news story of the decade in Japan, and she was a journalist. And I'm sorry to say my friend uh, Chikako died in Boston in 2004 because she was riding a bicycle and got struck by a car. By Akko. Another interesting issue to consider looking at these Asian religious movements is the different relationships to government authority they involve. Krishna consciousness has been through scandals and lawsuits, but it has cleaned up its act and now enjoys little friction with public or government in any of the countries where 
it is now based. So we might say Krishna consciousness has made it. It has become an accepted religion in many places around the world. And I also believe it deserves praise for having come to terms with some real problems in its internal organization and operation, such as uh, child abuse and sexual abuse, and it seems to have successfully taken measures to prevent these things from happening again. Diamond Way also has a smooth relationship with government authorities, and it has had no scandals despite the seemingly scandalous, or at least outrageous and possibly questionable behavior and statements of Lama Ole. No friction with the government here. Different story with Om Shinrikyo. It is now cited as one of the classic examples of a dangerous cult. So its leadership has been arrested, jailed, interrogated, and sentenced to death, and has also caused the Japanese government and, and also some governments in other countries to create new anti-cult laws, which may in future provide some difficulties for new religious movements, but are understandable as a response to what truly was a dangerous religion. And another uh, Japanese religion that I don't have time to go into in this presentation, but I'll just mention in passing, is Pano Wave. This developed in the late 90s, early 00s, in, um, in Japan, and it also had ideas of uh, dangerous radiation coming through the atmosphere that the members had to protect themselves from. They're particularly concerned with cell phones and that kind of um, radiation. And Panawave was famous for uh, its members wearing these triangular aluminum foil hats, which were meant to protect them from radiation. So when you hear jokes about people wearing tinfoil hats, well, the original basis of this, the original source, is Pano Wave. Another Asian religion that has run into conflict with government is Falun Gong in China. And, and I should mention that Pano Wave um, was subject to a lot of scrutiny in Japan not because it was engaged in anything particularly harmful or dangerous, but simply that after Om Shinrikyo, sensitivities were on high alert. Now, Falun Gong is a different kind of story. It emerged as a meditation, health-based movement in the early 1990s. And at first, the Chinese government, the communist government, embraced it partly because in 1989, China had gone through the terrible Tiananmen Square protest that had almost overthrown the government and really had ripped the society apart. And in the early 90s, the Chinese government was happy to see something come along that could absorb people's interest in energy and yet be a completely apolitical thing focused on spirituality, meditation, and so forth. But by the end of the 1990s, Falun Gong became a very large organization, and then the government saw it as threatening and then began to persecute it vigorously. This has caused a dispersion of Falun Gong around the world. And depending where you are living, there may be Falun Gong in your area now. Where I live in Middletown, New York, there is indeed a rising Chinese community, many of whose members seem to be, uh, many, of, uh, the, many of these people of which seem to be members of Falun Gong. So Asian religions have had their clashes with authority and other times have been able to coexist uh, quite peacefully without any problems. So now, let me ask, what do you think about these Asian-derived or Asian-based new religious movements? How do you see the appeal of these different groups, and do any of them appeal to you? What do you see as the pros and cons of these movements, either inside themselves or for society overall? 
And if you had to choose one to join, which would you choose? And that's where I will stop this lecture. I hope you enjoy the readings and find these religions interesting to learn about.